Welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you're going to join us today. We are going to be talking with Tracy Cram Perkins, and she has written this marvelous book called Dementia Home Care, How to Prepare Before, During, and After. And this book is absolutely marvelous. We're going to cover five little known secrets about making your home more dementia friendly. She is just loaded, loaded with great contact. And so is her book. In fact, I'm going to hold it up here. It is just absolutely marvelous. Um, So before I introduce you to Tracy, I just want to encourage you all to go to alzheimerspeaks.com because we have put together a ton of free resources for you that we've curated um, since, gosh, 2009, since we've been doing this. Everything is free. Uh, You don't have to sign up for a subscription to download anything. It's just there and accessible. So check that out. Check out our book tab. You'll find out about Betty the Bald Chicken, Lessons in How to Care. It's a great children's book, but really it's good for any ages and any stages of life. And then, of course, don't forget to go to DementiaMap.com. That is our global resource directory that has over 150 categories you can search Uh, You can also search by keywords or just click on some dots on the map. There's a calendar of events. There's a shop. There's a blog. uh, There's a glossary of terms and so much more. So with no further ado, uh, let's introduce you to Tracy. Well, Tracy, I am so excited to have this conversation with you. For those of you that don't know Tracy, she is like a bubble of joy and filled with just great energy and, and is somebody who's doing wonderful things. Um, The few times that I've been able to speak with her, um, I always just feel energized and I'm sure you're going to as well. So Tracy, I'm going to have you go ahead and introduce yourself because you can, you can do a better job that than I can, but I just appreciate your spirit and and the work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Lori. I'm Tracy Cram Perkins. I'm the author of Dementia Home Care, How to Prepare Before, During, and After. Uh, it was the 2022 SIBA Award winner for Best How-To Manual. And I am just really excited to be here. There's, I've done 16 years of caregiving for four different family members. I don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself a survivor. Okay, wonderful. So let's start out how how you became a dementia caregiver. You said, you know, you've got a lot of experience there, but can you give us a little more detail on how that all dropped into your life? Oh, it, it started with my younger sister and a panicked phone call because the first one was she called because my dad called her and said he could not take care of our mom anymore. And my mom had cancer and the cancer treatment had given her dementia. And it was post-operative cognitive decline, also uh, known as anesthesia dementia. And we didn't know what that meant. And we didn't know anything about dementia So we had a family meeting uh, because we wanted to see what was going on. And we came and sat down in my folks' apartment. We're all sitting around the dining room table. And this is the first time my mom had, we really saw her as she was and not rising to the occasion and them covering for each other. My dad was so exhausted. He was falling asleep during the meeting. And so we really understood it, even though they had somebody in there giving them help because we we didn't live close by at that point, And we were all then moving closer together, the entire family. Um, it became evident that my mom was now in need of hospice. And we didn't realize that. And we were all also rather young. I mean, I, I was 41 at the time, so I wasn't exactly you know young yet, but I was young enough. I hadn't dealt with any anything to do with aging. And we had to scramble to get her into a 
care facility just because there we didn't have the time to get hospice going and, and have it doing it in their apartment. So it's it just it was very it, it had to happen quick, basically. After that, then my mom passed and my dad was living on his own. He had diabetes and he wasn't taking care of himself. And we were doing daily checks and my sisters and I were alternating who would be checking on him every day after work. And he was also covering and we didn't realize it. Um, then he, my younger sister, it was her turn to go in and she walked into his apartment and found him unconscious on his living room floor with his face planted in his sofa. And they took him to the hospital. When he came to, he was diagnosed with moderate Alzheimer's disease. In his apartment, because now they wouldn't release him to us because he was living by himself. So we had, uh, and I didn't have power of attorney. So we were told we could not take him home with us. And they shunted him into the system. And he ended up going from, through a series of care facilities, starting from a group home, all the way up to the most secure facility in our county and we struggled because we were trying to figure out how we could get him it's and it's not easy to get power of attorney i might add so if it hasn't been granted ahead of time you're going to jump through hoops like you would not believe and my dad didn't believe there was anything wrong with him because he was one of those people that was very physically active and didn't realize his mind was going which is rather typical and so when he wanted to go for a walk to get exercise and they would tell him no because he was a, an elopement risk which meant he would wander and so so he just took it into his own hands and he would escape because he was still very with it. Even though he was in moderate Alzheimer's disease, he hadn't lost the skills from his jobs yet. So at the last place he was in, he was sharing a room with a gentleman who had full cognition. And my dad could rise to the occasion. And if you didn't hear, hear him start repeating himself, you wouldn't know. He waited till his roommate went into physical therapy. And then he went up to the plate glass window because he noticed there was a flaw in how it was put in the into the frame. He unscrewed the windows. He was in his pajamas and slippers. He lifted the glass out, put it outside the room, climbed out, put it back in, and mounted it like it was supposed to be connected and walked away. And the facility didn't have any cameras pointing towards the windows because no one had ever done that before. And so he was gone for a full 30 minutes before they knew he was gone. And so they called nine one one to report it. And then about 30 minutes later, uh, people were calling from Pacific Highway South, which is this enormous highway outside of Tacoma. And there was an elderly gentleman crossing against the light across uh, six lanes of traffic, trying to get to the freeway. And so they're okay. calling 911. The sheriff found him because he was tired by this point and he was sitting on the guardrail leading onto the freeway entrance. And so he asked him if he wanted to ride home. And my dad said, sure. And the officer obviously had experience with dementia before because he had him sit in the front seat with them, was talking about all the gear, and they drove back and they had a great time. And when they got there, my dad showed them because they asked him, How did you get out? And he showed them how. He got out, explained where they had the problem, and demonstrated to the people in their maintenance group how to fix it. And they went through the entire building and found that 30% of their windows had that problem. And so they fixed them all, but they didn't change how they treated him. And so instead of you know treating him like an adult and talking to him and guiding him and saying, no, we can't do that, but we can do this instead, they would scream at him every time he went to a door or a window and so he finally figured out how to do the one final escape before they said, we're done. And it was two days before Christmas. And they called to let me know that they were done and that we had to find a place for him. And we had five days to do it in. So we were hosting Christmas. We had to cancel Christmas. And then my husband and I had to figure out how to make our home dementia friendly because we had just been granted the power of attorney. So everything kind of fell into place. And so two days after or three days after Christmas, we got him home. And once we got him home, he was saying to me, he goes, Tracy, I have Alzheimer's disease, not the plague. What does it take to be treated like a human being? And that's what started my real journey. Wow. What a, what a story. What a story. And, and people don't understand. You kept referring to, you know, he could, um, he could rise to the occasion and people don't understand that so many, even family members, because they see that rise and they think, you know, whoever is crazy thinking mom or dad or whoever isn't capable because they're not, they're not seeing the norm. 
they're seeing that rise. And it, it is kind of fascinating with all of that. Um, and it's amazing that he saw that, that little opportunity with the window, no one did. And then to be able to show them all exactly what it was and be able to retrace it um, is, is just fascinating. Well, I know in, in talking with you, um, you have five little known kind of secrets to make your home dementia friendly. And I'm sure when you brought your dad home, you didn't immediately know all of those things are my guess. You probably learned by trial and error, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Let us know. Oh, no, I knew nothing. Matter of fact, when what I thought made my home dementia friendly was so far off. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh at it now because everything I thought was the right thing to do was wrong. And you know, it, it caused a lot of angst. But um, what I did learn is I learned that glare in the afternoon can cause hallucinations on the floor or you know, if your floor has glare. So I had um, hardwood floors because I have allergies. And so I had to figure out, first of all, why my dad was having these hallucinations and freaking out. And I didn't know what it was that was causing the problem. And so the, the flooring was the first thing I figured out. Plus spacing between furniture because their perception, their depth perception is different. If there's not enough contrast, they're not going to be able to see and they can trip and fall on things that you and I wouldn't have a problem with. Uh, I have pets. And so my cats would scatter their toys hither and yawn. And I would have to, before he would get up, go through and make sure they were all off the floor so that he's not falling. Um, so there's a lot of things that we learned um, the hard way. And then I started researching it because I knew that I, I couldn't be the first person doing this. People have had been talking about Alzheimer's disease since the 80s. So I, I had been aware that it existed. I just didn't know where to start looking for it. And so it was okay. So I've got to take care of the flooring first. Uh, then I found out that area rugs were a bad thing because they were a trip hazard and you can fall. Even if you have, you think you have them taped down, that doesn't always work. They can still trip on them. Uh, covering uh, electrical cords and removing, you know, electrical cords because I didn't realize that that was a bad thing either. And you don't, in your daily life in your home, you can walk around and you know where the hazards are and you just avoid them. Well, somebody whose perception is becoming tunnel vision, and then I I'll, we're also going to talk about this a little bit later, but they get achromatopsia. So they start losing their ability to see colors. So what they see is black and white, and then they can see bright colored contrast. And so I didn't know that, and I didn't understand the importance of lighting or daylight lighting. And my house was a kind of dark, and so I didn't understand that he needed more contrast to be able to see things. And I would see him doing weird stuff. Like he'd pick something up off the counter and he would go like this, which is holding it like two inches from his eyes. And then he'd put it back down and, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And, and one of them was just a, a, a snack for him. And he couldn't tell what it was because a, I had it on a white plate. It was white cheese and white crackers. He had no clue what he was looking at and he couldn't eat it. And I'm like, I would, but there's your snack. And so, again, I just did not know or understand the use of colors to see contrast and to have daylight lighting. And the thing with daylight lighting is it's too bright for most of us. And so then we finally figured out about dimmer switches. And if you can put it down to where the rest of us are comfortable when he's not there and then turn it up when he needs it. But in doing so, that's how I discovered that the daylight lighting helped with sundowners. And as he's starting to sundown, I would start turning the light up, not realizing just because it was getting darker, I would turn the light up and then he started behaving better. It was like, oh my gosh, what is this? And so I had to start research that too. But you, it's just trial and error. It, it really is. You covered so many things there. We're going to dive in a little bit deeper with these, but let's start with the use of color. Um, in terms of, of how that can be used. I know color can be used even to prevent wandering and people are going to go, what? How, how the heck is that? Okay, let's explain how this happened to me first. Um, as you know, my father was a bit of an escape artist, but he also was very excited to help my husband out in the yard. And they would go out and they would garden and they'd pull weeds and they'd trim 
bushes and whatever they do. And then they'd come back in together because it was their bonding time. And when they would come in, I live in a very, uh, it's very wooded. We don't have lawn. And so it, they would bring in beauty bark and they'd bring in dirt and whatever. And it would get tracked all over the house. And I was cleaning it up because they'd go in and out and in and out and in and out. And then we'd get tracked everywhere. And I, and I just wanted floors clean. So I went to the local hardware store. I bought a doormat and just happened to be one of those black doormats. And I stuck it in front of the door. Uh, I did, I should say I bought two. I had one inside, one outside just to make sure I got all the stuff. And my husband walks in, he wipes his feet and keeps going. And my dad kind of looks at me and he turns around, he walks in the back door of the house. He wouldn't go in the, the side door. And I thought, okay, that's kind of weird. So this ha went on for a couple of days. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to win this battle. And I just moved the, one of the carpets to the other door thinking that was, you know, maybe he was protesting that I didn't know. And so then he wouldn't go in either one of those doors and he would only come through the garage. <laughs> and that's when I thought, okay, this is really weird. What is going on here? And I started researching black, the color black, and found a researcher named Alice Cronin Golem at the University of Boston who does study with people with severe Alzheimer's disease. And she was studying uh, things with color, and she said that black looks like a hole. So I, uh, I, decided to experiment with it just a little bit because I didn't want to freak my dad out because I'd already seen what melting down does and and I didn't want one of those but I was just asking his opinion and so I just engaged him a little bit and said well what do you think about this door is there anything I could do to make it easier for you to go in and he goes can you fix the hole it was like my first confirmation so it was like okay I took those up I put different shades of, of doormats out there and the problem was gone but then I put it on the inside and then he would, he, I wouldn't have to say anything to him and he would just turn around. He wouldn't walk out that door. Now my bathrooms both have light colored floors and I had brown, dark brown uh, carpets, you know, like the, the bath mat and the toilet mat and stuff. I had that on the floor. And when he started getting farther along, he was, he stopped using the bathroom that had that mat in it and it dawned on me okay dark colors when there's not enough light contrast this is a problem so I changed it as I started getting smarter and put different colors out there so that he could see the contrast and what worked best for him because I he, we also had an issue where later he got confused about using the toilet and whenever sundowners would start he'd use the tub instead so it was trying to help him orient to know, to recognize what it was, to give color contrast. We ended up painting the wall behind the toilet to make it a brighter color so it stood out from the rest of the white walls so that he could see it. And then that helped sometimes. I can't guarantee it helped all the time, but it, it did help him. So that was kind of finding how to use color. And then the wandering really became an issue later where all I had to do was I didn't have to do anything else. I just stuck the mats in front of the doors and he wouldn't go out. And then when we were ready to leave, I would discreetly remove the mat and we would just go. Okay. Well, you know, I learned about the, the black mats and stuff at the nursing home my mom was at. And oh. they, um, in terms of talking with them, um, actually, I think I told them about it now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, I, I was telling them about the colors and they were talking about people escaping through the elevators. And so they put a mat, you know, outside the elevator then to help stop people there. And, um, and they also, um, sometimes put one by the nurse's station because people would hang out there and then they couldn't have kind of private conversations and stuff that they felt they they needed to have mm -hmm. and that would keep people away from the desk or they wouldn't kind of reach over and grab stuff that they shouldn't have and stuff too. <laughs> um the other thing I'll mention with color and this kind of goes into spatial issues too but for my mom like when we would walk she would always be tapping her toe in front of her and I really noticed it when there was a color change. So if we were going from like cement to asphalt to grass, she wasn't sure what it was. And so she would kind of tap her, I would be holding on to her and she'd be tapping her toe and I'd be telling her, you know, what the changes are. And then um, Norms McNamara, who's living with Louis Body over in the UK, I'll never forget the story he told about going into a store and it was... Um, it was just a normal shop and it had green carpets, 
but it had like this um, root system or this vine system with flowers. And he said it scared the heck out of him because when he saw the dark green and then he saw the gold for these vines, he thought they were snakes coming up at him. And that was his visual perception of that. So there's so many um, different ways that we have to take color into, into place. I know um, over in the UK, they do this much more than we do here, but they, they have colored toilet seats that, you know, so that people can aim or sit and know that it's because like you said, in bathrooms, so often everything's white or cream color and it all blends in. Uh, same with their light switches so that people can find those they can because we try to make them blend into the wall so they don't stand out um, and we're seeing that more now too I think use of color with like grab bars and things so that people can find them so it's kind of endless but it does make a huge huge difference and then of course with plates for food like you mentioned um, with, you know, having a, a red plate maybe so that that white sandwich shows. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very, very um, interesting stuff. For those of you that are just tuning in, we are talking with uh, Tracy Perkins, who is a four-time dementia caregiver survivor. And she is the author of uh, Dementia Home Care, how to prepare before, during, and after. And she also is the host of Dementia Home Care Show um, on US Global TV as well. And we're just thrilled to have her with us. Um, you're gonna wanna rewind if you're just hopping in now because we've, we've covered a lot of ground and yet it's nothing compared to what she has in her book. I mean, this thing is so detailed. I really are, encourage people uh, to, to pick that up. You can go to her website at tracycrameperkins.com uh, and uh, get more information there. We're gonna talk um, next about some challenges dealing with dementia and sundowning and some common things in the kitchen as well that you know, will make your home safer and more comfortable for everybody. Tracy, I want to ask you about lighting because you mentioned lighting with, with sundowners and, you know, I've seen you, I'm starting to see a lot more research on this, but people, I still don't think understand. Some people don't even understand what sundowners is. So if you kind of want to define that in your own way and then talk about how you found light um, impacting that. Oh, I would love to talk about this. Uh, in my worldview, sundowners is a worsening of behaviors in the in the evening and can start anywhere from as early as three o'clock, go all the way up to eight o'clock. And it's, it tends to show up as confusion and fear. And, you know, uh, one time we had an odd behavior where I had a family member walking around with a TV remote and was banging it on everything and then figured out later that they were trying to be helpful because that's they used to cook dinner at the same time we were cooking dinner and they felt like they needed to be doing something but they didn't know what but I didn't understand why they were banging it otherwise I would have and, and I discovered this by watching a Tipa Stowe video where she was talking about somebody doing the same thing and that's how I figured out what was going on because I I don't intuitively figure these things out. I have to start searching it and finding it. So none of these things are original. They're all things that I have discovered and I want to make sure that everyone's got them in one place. But with the lighting, um, we had a, in my own home, it was rather dark. And so my, again, there was not enough contrast. And so it made it difficult to see. And one of the things to understand, if you didn't hear this earlier, is about a chromatopsia. Because as Alzheimer's disease and certain other dementias progress, it means that their vision changes. So they will have tunnel vision, which is something you want to take advantage of as they get farther in, understanding that they're only going to look at something that's about waist high to eye level, and that's all they're going to see. You, uh, We also want to look at, is there enough color or light contrast to be able to see the corners of tables, to be able to see if there's a step in front of them. And so it was. it's looking at all of these things in your home. It, can they see the toilet? from the floor? Can they see it against the wall? Can they see where the chairs are to sit in them? 
or do all the things blend together? Because what happens if you have this very lovely living room and the walls are a beige and your furniture is all this lovely light color and it all blends together and you want them to sit down and they start screaming when you try to force them to sit in the chair and you put, they put their hands, it doesn't matter if they can feel their hands on the arms of the chairs. They're not going to sit in that chair because they don't believe it's there. And they're, we've told ourselves our entire life, we've trusted our brains our whole life that, you know, it's telling us what's actually there and we don't see it. So it's not there. And so I was reading a book by, I believe it's Joanne Koenig Costi, and I might be saying her name wrong called learning to speak Alzheimer's. It's a phenomenal book and it's a great book for setting up your house. And she was explaining how to do the color contrast. And so that's when I figured out if I threw a blanket that was not the same color as my chair, my dad would sit in it. Or if I stuck a pillow that he could see so he could sit down and in my house, I had lampshades everywhere. I didn't have overhead, a whole lot of overhead lighting except in the bedrooms. Well, we started adding overhead lighting so that he could see that there weren't bugs crawling the walls or things in the corners or because uh, if I had too many flickering candles at the holidays, he would start having issues seeing things that none of the rest of us saw. So there's a lot of different things you can do with keeping the light up light enough to reduce shadows and reduce glare. Um, also, uh, the way the light comes in in the afternoons or in the early mornings where you might have to adjust something using blinds or shades because that can also create problems with contrast and being able to see and can also make the floor look like it's icy. If it makes the, if you've got a shiny floor, it could look like ice to somebody with dementia. Kind of like you were mentioning earlier about the gentleman seeing the snakes in the carpet. It's, there's a lot of different things that you can do with the lighting to eliminate shadows eliminate glare and then as the sun goes down turning the lights brighter so that they are not as affected by the sun going down yeah there's a community here in um, i want to say it's centerville minnesota called atlas and they use lighting um, and they they lighten and darken the the hallway depending on the time of day and they have like birds tweeting and stuff in the background and it feels like you're outside and the ceiling is curved and it's it's clouds. And so you really feel like you're outside, but it really helps them a lot with getting people waking them up and putting them to sleep. Um, and then again with the sundowning as well. Um, one of the examples I'll just throw in here about glare, and this was uh, Harry Urban said this and he's living with dementia out in Pennsylvania. And he said during one of our dementia chat conversations that he was getting really paranoid. He was at his desk and he was working and he kept thinking somebody was behind him and he would look and he wouldn't see anybody. And then he would turn and he would feel this presence again. And it took quite a while, he said, but his wife, Hazel, figured out it was it was the sun coming through the blinds. And if there was like a cloud that would go by, you know, it would, it would change it. And they ended up shutting the blinds and then that was it. He didn't have that, that change and that, that feeling of somebody watching over, over him. And I thought that that was fascinating. You also mentioned about, you know, your candles and kind of twinkling lights and, but holidays we can have, you know, we can have flashing and blinking and different colored lights and music that goes with them and all of that stuff can be really, really confusing to somebody with dementia. And sometimes people will even have them lined up the steps, which could be a plus or a minus, depending on how that's done, um, you know, or on the handrails and things. So it, it, it is so critical to pay attention to all of these things, because not only will it make your house safer um, for them, but it's going to make it more comfortable. So you're not going to have um, maybe behaviors that you don't like or reactions that you don't like, because you don't know why they're doing them. And, you know, when they're happy and comfortable, you can be happy and comfortable. Everyone's not kind of walking on eggshells going, what's next? What's next? So um, Tracy, I think it's just amazing that you took everything that came before you and you turned it into a, not only a learning lesson for you and your family, but then you took the time to put it in this fantastic book 
that shares all these lessons and tips with others. I mean, it's incredible because we don't know. I mean, I, I think probably the most common thing people hear is, you know, pick up your throw rugs. They're a, they're a tripping hazard because people's gait isn't as good and they don't pick up their feet as much. Um, but there's so many other layers to why those rugs can be hazardous as well, um, from color to texture to, um, to all kinds of things there. Now, it, are there some other things that you um, want to add to the sundowning at all? Or do you feel like we covered that topic pretty good? I, I think we've covered it pretty good. I mean, we might, might circle back to it if there's something you else you think of, and then we could tie it in. Okay, sounds good. Well, I, I think another area, um, you know, that people don't understand all of the kind of pitfalls in the kitchen, you know, that can happen. Do you have a few tips for, you know, just how do you make your kitchen more dementia friendly? I mean, I think people think, okay, I'll, I'll hide the knives because I don't want someone getting cut, but, or maybe we'll disconnect the garbage disposal in the stove so that there's not a fire. Those are probably the primary things that I hear. What do you, what do you hear and see and when, what have you experienced? Well, I, I found that, okay, my father was really good at figuring things out. He was good with his hands. So I had to th- do things that he didn't see. And so uh, one of the things we discovered is that we could, we had an electrician come in and put in a on off switch in one of the cabinets that was electrically attached to our stove and could act like a circuit breaker. And so we would just flip that switch when we didn't want anyone using it because I have a glass cooktop. Mm -hmm. So you can't tell necessarily if it's hot without put, you know, putting your hand right on top of it necessarily. So we didn't want that to happen because one of the most common things that happens is they'll burn something on the stove and they'll walk away. I mean, they just put something on there and then it catches fire. And then recently I found out about this really cool product called Firebot. And it is designed for specifically for folks with dementia so that it can be placed over the stove and it is non-toxic. And if it senses the heat going up rapidly as if you are burning carrots or something in on the stove because the water boiled dry um, it will spray until it suppresses the fire and then you can use household cleaners to clean it up it it, even soap and water it doesn't matter it's not toxic and it will put the fire out within a few seconds so it's a really incredible product and it just hooks up right up there where your fan goes and i was like so impressed when i saw this product i was like i tell everybody i know about it because it's a big deal. Somebody could set their house on fire. They could, you know, literally light up the, the, their, their ceiling and very quickly. So anything to prevent that from happening. And it, they have inexpensive refills that you can put into this and it is battery operated. So you don't have to worry about the power going out and having it not operate. So it like sits up in the fan? Yeah, it's, it's, it's connected right below the fan. It's like on a T-bar and then it has a, 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 cassette that carries all the suppressed spray in it it's compressed spray and then it goes across where the flame is and it discharges it and it literally puts this kind of a foam over it and it kills the oxygen so that the fire goes out and it doesn't matter if it's you know it'll put out the pan it'll put out whatever's in the pan and it'll just sit there until you clean it up and give you time to get it turned off you know the the stove turned off wow that's cool I've, i've never heard of that one yeah, it's out of a company. I think they're in New Jersey, but I won't switch it. But I know they're for sure on the East Coast. And it was just something that one of the gentlemen did because he saw what his, was, his parents were going through and decided that that was probably a great thing. And, and it's worked out really well for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I really love that idea. And then uh, capping off my garbage disposal, I just, it was very simple. Uh, I just put the little clothes, it comes with the garbage disposals. You just put the lid in there and then just stays and then you can't tell and they just then it's the thing about having overfill with water it's just you know kind of being cognizant of that i don't have a trick yet for turning off the faucet that because i didn't have to deal with that so i I don't have one yet but i do have an interesting product that i just learned about yesterday 
that was, it's an alarm pad that you put on the floor so that if somebody's going there where they're, when they're not supposed to, you can have, it's kind of like a, a baby alarm remote, except that it gives you a doorbell sound. So let's say you have somebody that's a fall risk getting out of bed. You put this pad down. It just looks like a, 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 a carpet and you stand on it. It's pressure sensitive. And then it sends a, a, a note or a, a message to the receiver, which is wherever you are. And it gives a ding, a bell that dings so that, you know, if somebody's a fall risk, they're getting out of bed, they're doing whatever. You can also put that in front of the stove or in front of the sink, and it will go off and alert you to where they're at so that you can get there and help them or stop them from doing something that could be harmful. It also means that you're not having to get up every single hour to check to make sure something bad isn't happening and you get a little more rest. Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I do a couple of support groups and the other day someone had mentioned that where they were sitting and they were I don't, they were reading or something and they didn't realize their loved one had left the house. You know, they were very quiet about leaving and they're like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden they're out the door and then they, they ended up going into the neighbor's house because the garage door was open. So they went out <laughs> one and, and into another and, you know, thank God the neighbors knew and, you know, it was, it was a safe situation. But nowadays you don't know somebody walking into your house nowadays, you don't know if you're going to get shot, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> the way things are. So letting your neighbors know is really wise, but having those some type of alarm, if it's on the floor or if it's on the door, um, or I know, and I don't know if you did this at all, but I know a lot of people change their location of their locks on the door, or they add one that's up higher where somebody wouldn't normally look for it. And, um, but again, that can be dangerous as well, you know, in case there is a fire and you want somebody to be able to get out. So, I mean, you have to weigh all of these things out for, for your own situation with that. Oh, speaking about the doors, I went kind of an old school and I got the, you know, the, the door knob decorations you have at, at Christmas time with the jingle bells on it. That way, every time the door opened, I could hear it all over the house. And, and because I didn't want my dad to think that we were singling him out, I kept Christmas decorations out so that he would just assume it's part of the holiday decorations. It was on all the doors and I had stuff all over the house. So he never questioned why I had the jingle bells on the doors. Okay. Well, because, that's... yeah, I didn't want to single him out because he's, he, I, the, you they get there i mean we're sensitive if we do something wrong and if we don't you know it, we when we're losing our cognition and you've experienced this with your mom um it we feel singled out a lot of times things are done that that's it's not intentional it's just that as a caregiver it doesn't occur to us that that they don't understand why we're doing this or that this is a problem and so if it's something where we can all do this together like i dealt with the messiness issue at dinner where we all wore aprons and I made sure that the aprons for the guys looked like their shop aprons. And then I have one for myself that was the same thing so that we all had aprons. And then after dinner, we took that off and I would throw it in and, and wash them. And it took care of the messiness issue for eating. And then nobody felt singled out. So just simple things to just be inclusive. Because I, I knew that I got a better response out of my dad if I if we weren't butting heads. And of course, we have the same personality. And that, you know, happened. <laughs> Well, and it is interesting, even when someone is having, you know, memory issues, what they can hold on to. Mm -hmm. And it's usually those really, those things that have real strong emotions. Like my mom, um, and this is a little off topic, but it kind of puts it home. I, I was, she was struggling with trying to put her bra on and she wanted to be independent. And, she, but she couldn't, she just couldn't hook it in the back. So we tried in the front, we tried all kinds of stuff. And finally, I had her talked into, why don't you just wear a camisole, which for her era, it's like, I'm not letting them hang. I need to be in a bra. That was a big thing to get her over that hurdle. And I finally got her over that hurdle. And then she mentioned it to a, a sister-in-law and the sister-in-law is like, well, I'll take you shopping. And it was like, oh gosh, uh -oh. you're not hearing this day-to-day -day struggle that she's having with all of this because it really would, would ruin her day. And we were, I'll never forget, we were up at the lake and she was mad at me. It was like a two and a half hour drive back home. She was mad at me the whole way home. She just held on to that, that, you know, I was being disrespectful to her. And that was the last thing I was trying to do. I was trying to give her 
independence, but um, things can get twisted and and misunderstood real, real easily. So I, I love how you, you know, in, in everything you do, you're, you know, it's dignity first. And, and it's saying to you're not in this alone. And, and what does it take for the rest of us to maybe throw on an apron? You know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really it's, a small thing. In the it is. It's the small things. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to keep your, your household calm, put on an apron's like nothing. I mean, it's, it's absolutely nothing. What about, um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about bathrooms. I loved when you talked about having uh, a colored wall behind the toilet to make it stand out. And, you know, we talked about the, the rugs and how that, you know, that can cause issue. Did you ever use like a, a colored toilet seat itself or some of them have the ring lights so men can aim a little better too, especially in the evening? <laughs> I, the ones with the ring lights did not exist when my dad was still living with us mm -hmm. and, or when we still living, I should say. But what I did do is I did do a colored toilet seat for a while. Um, we also had installed raised toilets because of he was a tall person and my husband was tall and I'm just average height. So I didn't mind being on tiptoes, but um, it was easier for him. And then he had an easier time using the toilet to find it because he turned the light on. The bathroom light was on at that point, a dimmer switch. And I, ha I made sure I had daylight lighting. So there was a lot of contrast so he could see things. But that doesn't mean I took care of the aim issue all the time. Sometimes we were good. Sometimes we were bad. It just depends on where his cognition was at that point. Um, and But it was it also made me more cognizant of what kind of wall I should have next to the toilet because at the time I had uh, uh, wallpaper. I'm, I'm going to blank on the word. Uh, I had wallpaper on the wall and it was starting to curl because of the, the misses. And so what I ended up doing is for a short term, I put up shelf paper because it's a little more uh, liquid resistant, shall we say. And I used that and then I peeled it off. And when we were all done, I sanded the walls and then I put a textured wall up just as you know to cover that up but it was it, using something just out of the box that I knew would work on a shelf would work on the wall and I didn't care it was just a solid color and it went with the bathroom and it just worked out well I have a question because I've seen more people doing this and I'm, I'm seeing more products being sold like this but even like in taking a shower or a bath people get confused on you know, what's the body wash, what's the shampoo, what's the conditioner. And I'm seeing a lot more people install dispensers, if it's kids or adults, whatever, and trying to cut down on the waste. It's like, no, you need one push, maybe two, that's it, you know, and then having kind of the different colors for the different things. And again, I don't think the contrast is is quite where we were talking at all. But did you ever have any issues with that? Well, my dad got to the point where he only wanted bar soap because he was raised during the depression and that's all they had. So we, we catered to that. And then he was bald. So, or, or actually had very, very short crew cut hair. I mean, it, so he just used soap everywhere. So we didn't have to tackle that particular issue, but I have seen people that do the dispensers and then they put words and pictures on them mm -hmm. so that it kind of makes sense. Cause I, one of my friends says, I thought this was very clever. Actually, she wrote shampoo and she had a person scrubbing their hair and it showed the, the foam on it. And then the other one was, was soap. And then she had a, a picture of a bar soap on there um, and, use that. I thought, okay, that's very clever using words and pictures together. Cause I would never have thought of that. Yeah. And some people can still read others can't, you know, mm -hmm. so those symbols all, all can, all can really help. Uh, it's just so interesting. What about a shower head? Did you, uh, you know, like when I grew up, there was just a permanent shower head and you positioned your body under it. And the, and the pressure that came out was what you got. But nowadays, you know, you can have the rain shower heads and you can have the multi pressures and the handheld and things. Uh, did you do any adjustments there? Uh, we did two things. When my dad was still able to manage everything, we had this 
giant shower head that was on an uh, arm that could, he could move it to fit whatever he wanted because he was afraid of having water in his face. That was his biggest fear was water in the face. So we had it so he could adjust it down and just get the rest of his body. And then it, uh, he could do his head with the washcloth. And so it, that way he had control over it. And then later we ended up installing a handheld shower, uh, head because it was just easier for us to to help him and and take care of business that way yeah I remember when my mom was in the nursing home and she always loved water and all of a sudden she was like fighting the showers just she would get really angry very agitated and I too went to Tipa one time at one of her conferences and I'm like can you help me out with this I, I don't understand what's happening and I found this fascinating and I said, it's almost like the water's hurting her. And I, I know it can't be. And she's like, well, you're wrong, Lori. It can. She said, as we age, we all lose our fat pads. And I'm like, well, my mom's like a big woman. And she's like, no, I'm not talking fat. I'm talking, she said, I'm talking fat pad that protects the nerves. And so when that water is coming down hard, it is scaring her. And, and we, you know, we start a lot of times with the showers, we put them in and it just boom out of nowhere, it comes. And she said, she highly recommended using a rain shower head, a handheld one. And she said, we should always start at their feet mm -hmm. and then work our way up. But she says, normal showers, we just put them in and it comes in, boom. And they don't know what's happening, which made a total sense. So I went into the nursing home and talked with the um, executive director. And I said, I want to purchase rain shower heads and handheld rain shower heads for all of your showers. And he's like, well, why would you want to do that? And I explained, uh, I explained that theory to him and it was like night and day, you know, and I mean, it's dangerous, excuse me. It's dangerous when someone is being combative in a shower, you know, mm -hmm. on a slippery floor. And I mean, what could happen? in that area. I think also choosing colors that are calming in bathrooms can be really helpful too, because uh, so many families struggle with grooming. Did you ever have to use a shower chair at all or a shower seat? Yes. Okay. Uh, but that wasn't for my dad, that was for my uncle. And he was had mobility issues and his dementia didn't manifest until the very end of his life. So for him, we were using that, but also the contrast came in to play for him because he couldn't, he was in an apartment that didn't have much lighting. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier just to put a, you know, it was a white shower chair. And we just put a towel over the top of it that was um, darker colored. So he could, I mean, well, it's brighter color actually. And so he could sit on it and see the shower chair and get in and out. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's, and then my aunt had a shower chair and she would sit and, and bathe also. But now that you're saying that about the, the uh, water, that makes perfect sense. I didn't understand why my aunt was having some fight issues at the end with bathing. So that, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. The other thing that I learned too, and you know, you start, your mind just starts expanding when you hear stuff like that, or it does for me. And then I start looking at what other sensory things could be issues that are triggers mm -hmm. that I just take for granted. And so even like being cold, you know, we, we get them undressed and a lot of times we don't have the shower ready or the tub ready, but we've got them undressed and then they're cold, you know, just wrapping them in, um, you know, in, in the uh, towels or having heated towel bars or even a little heater. Sometimes if you're like, I'm in Minnesota, it can get chilly uh, sometimes in certain areas, um, you know, little small things like that can make a huge, huge difference. I also wanted to ask you about kind of hopping back out, out of the bathroom and into the kitchen. Did you find other um, scenarios, let's just say for serving and, and um, dishes? I know you had mentioned kind of the plate and stuff, but did you kind of go full blown on, on colored dishes for contrast or? No, I, my dad was okay having his own special bowl and plate because he was getting upset with himself for being messy and, and I mean, catastrophic failure upset because he knew he should be able to do this and he couldn't. And so um, we ended up 
He would want to sit at the kitchen counter where he could be messy or it didn't matter because it was easy to clean. And then we, I made sure he had a white plate when we had colored food. And then when we had what I, I, okay, I'm crazy. Once a month, I would do monochromatic meals just for fun. And then he would get either a blue or, or a red plate and just so that we could have some contrast there because I, they needed something to break it up and the guys were getting bored. And so I just would do something weird and fun and we'd have all the food, all the same color or something, but um, <laughs> that's quirky, but the, you know, or, or whatever their dish was, but um, yeah, I ended up doing, uh, and then I found scoop plates, which I didn't even know existed. And wow, was that eye opening because of the curved bowl, they could actually scoop it up with their hand and then eat it uh, after the point where he could not eat from, you know, eat with a fork or, you know, just he had to self feed still, and and the longer I could keep him empowered, the better off he was, and I was because there, you know, the level of exhaustion that you get to, and the it, it's it's just draining. When he would get upset or afraid, he would be at my door. And the, the, the typical example was when he first moved in with us, he was terrified of everything because of all the things he'd gone through, including being sent to two geriatric psych wards and being taped to beds and drugged. So he had some definite safety concerns and I was his safe space and so when he first the six months he moved in with us at first six months he was at my door every 30 minutes calling my name because he was upset about something I would get him calmed down uh, he refused to sleep in a bed and he would only sleep in a chair and then something would startle him and we'd start it over again it would go on night after night after night until we hit about the six month mark and then he felt safe that he wasn't going to be moved around anymore and, and felt better so anything that I could find that made him feel safe and could empower him I was all for that because the level of exhaustion you have by that point you don't even know if you're up or down or sideways or or it, are you, you're afraid to fall asleep at some points because you're thinking oh god he's coming any second your blood pressure is going through the ceiling so it, it when you get to that level of exhaustion anything you can do to make it easier you're going to do yeah exactly I know for dishes you know we didn't know the color contrast so much but one of the things that I've learned over time is we always hear about tunnel vision, but some people who have had a stroke, their tunnel vision might be this way. It might be to the right or to the left. It might not be directly ahead. So you really have to kind of test that out because they're not going to find that out necessarily, you know, going to the eye doctor even a lot of times because they just can't follow the chart depending on how good the doctor is and how much patience they have. So being able to, you know, when sometimes we're saying, you know, eat this in front of you and they're not seeing it kind of going, I don't know where it is or where they're, they're looking for something. And you're thinking, how do they not see that? It's because that's not their, their vision path. And I, I know I didn't know, I mean, I just thought it was a quirky behavior. I didn't know it was because it wasn't what they were seeing mm -hmm. uh, at all. But I know a lot of people in, in many communities now have colored plates. They've got green or blues, the deep colors to be able to have that contrast for everybody, you know, against maybe a white tablecloth type thing. And again, it can be um, even the silverware can be wrapped in that and have um, kind of a rubbery edge so it's easier to, to handle and a little bit bigger or it can be the silverware can even be bent just so it's easier for them to maneuver the curved plate like you said or bowl is huge or they have even one that raises it so it's up a little higher um, there's just so many cool things out there that I knew none of this stuff at all well have you seen the stuff they've created for people with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. those are some of the coolest things like the forks and the spoons. For, for people that haven't seen them, they have large grips on them because the person with Parkinson's is having the tremors. And then it, it has a specially formed either scoop for the spoon or, or the way the fork is going. It can be in an angle depending on how the person you know eats. But it's one of those things that it's easier for somebody who has reduced cognition to manipulate because their fine motor skills are going and they're not going to be able to do it uh, with a, a fork or a spoon. Or, I mean, if they had been a master at chopsticks, they're not going to be able to be a master at chopsticks now. And they're, anything we can find that's a tool for them that's already in place. I mean, it's not, it, it, I was surprised that when I met somebody that had Parkinson's dementia and the family was explaining to, to me what they had done to take care of them and 
and the tools that they had, because it never occurred to me to look outside my little Alzheimer's window at the bigger picture up until that point. And that's a great point, because what's good for one can be good for a lot of others. It, it's kind of like caregiving, you know, the skills overlap, um, the issues overlap. And so we, we have to share those things. Uh, really, really important. Well, I, I do have one other area I want to ask you about, and this actually isn't in the home, but it, it but it just has to do with living life. And that is, did you ever have any issues with the car? I know with my mom getting her in, backing her up, I mean, it changed over time as her mobility changed and the you know the grabbers weren't always where she needed them um was that an issue for you and did you find any tricks with that well uh, we didn't have that many issues the with the with the car because uh, we first started out we had a big red pickup truck mm -hmm. and so because i was the only short person my dad had no problem getting into the car or out of it and for him the grab bars were at the perfect location um, but i did find later that they have they sell grab bars that you can install in between the window and the door that uh, so that door frame so that you can have somebody that needs the extra help to get up and out or in depending so that you it's adjustable and then of course there are also uh, steps that are available also if somebody's having an issue getting in or out and i had a friend the other day who's 85 that i was transporting and i was also taking somebody else who had dementia to an event and my friend who is 85, I drive a Mini Cooper, a really old Mini Cooper, and she couldn't get out. And we were concerned we wouldn't be able to get her out. And I was also wrangling a gentleman who was 85 or, uh, by 80, who, who had moderate dementia. And so fortunately, he was entertained enough that he stayed with us. And I didn't have to worry about him wandering off as we tried to solve the problem of getting the seat far enough forward to get her out because there were no handholds. And that was the first time I thought, oh, my gosh. I can't be transporting people in this car because it's just not designed for doing that. I will have to make sure I have something that's more adequate to take people around because there's, it just, it just was not there for them. And, and I didn't have anything set up where my old car, I had an old four door geo prism and it was low to the ground. So it was easy for people to get in and out and the doors open wide enough that I could put my toes against their toes and, and do the, uh, you know, the assist where I pull them back so that they could get it to the stand up position. But yeah, that's, pretty much all I've got for cars. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I know, you know, we used my parents' car, which was a sedan, and that worked good for both of them. My dad had brain cancer, my mom with dementia for a while. But then actually, and then I had like a conversion van, and that was too much crawling up and in. And even though it had the grab bars, and it had the steps and all that. So then when I ended up with like a, just a regular SUV, that was an easier height. But I think one of the things people forget about, and, and this is so common, is adjusting the seat height, high or low. Because a lot of times it's up high and you got to adjust it low for them to get in or to get out so that their feet can touch depending on how tall somebody is. Mm -hmm. And then you can go ahead and adjust it up or um, even a seat belt extension. Sometimes that can be tough for us reaching around and and doing that. And then those um, portable um, grab bars that can be installed, but there's, there's so many different things. I haven't really seen those. And I, I bet they're out there now in different colors for contrast though, too, because I, again, I think that is just so important. Well, you have so many tips in your book. Um, again, I really encourage people to get, to get her book. Again, it's look how big this thing is. I mean, it's just a nice, nice size. It has huge print. Well, you probably can't see, but it's got big print. There's room to be able to make notes, you know, on the on the edges. Um, it's just the table of contents. You can kind of see what's there, or you can go to the index um, to be able to find what you want. It's not like you have to sit down and read the whole thing at once. Um, but there's just so much there and you, you've really, to me, it's just a great toolbox for people to have. Are there, is there anything you want to mention about the book itself? And I, I think it's really important for people to know why you constructed it the way that you did, because I think we take that for granted. Well, I, my personal frustration, well, I read over 30 books while I was caring for my family 
and none of them met me where I was, where it, the table of content would be so scant. And I'm not saying this is a problem, but I mean, it just for me, it was a problem because I'm a page fanner. And when I'm stressed out, I want to be able to flip pages and find what I need. And I couldn't find that in any books. So I made an eight page table of contents so that you can literally run your finger down that page to the challenge of the day and turn to the to that chapter and there's it is step by step i also put in text boxes so you can page fan through and find things more quickly uh, again because I, I would go to a book i would my dad would be melting down about something like we had an issue where he thought his coat was full of poisonous gas and i had to figure out how to deal with that on the fly and thank god i got through it but and then it was like okay i remember reading something about it but i can't remember where and it wasn't until three weeks later that i actually found the solution that would have helped me and so it was why can't that be easier to find and why can't it all be in one place? So what I did is I ended up putting everything in the order that I had to deal with it, which I figured everyone else was going to find and just make sure that there were step-by-step -step instructions and also the weird stuff that I didn't expect to have happen. I put in there too, because I found out that that was also common. And uh, even if it had to do with, you know, after they've passed, you know, who do you report, you know, to and where do you get your death certificates from? Uh, how do you prevent people from stealing their identity after they died? What do you do if you, you have, you know, a uh, token currency? I mean, all these things that you wouldn't think about now that you're facing it because now you've just lost them and now you're having to deal with the aftermath. So there's, I threw every nut and bolt I could find in there. Yeah, it, it really is a wonderful, wonderful resource. And it's one of those books like, uh, you know, normally I, I get a lot of books to review and I and I give them out. I'll keep this one because it's oh. just such a great, great resource. Um, and I'll be selfish. I'll tell people about it, but I, I won't I won't give it away like I normally do with the others because it is just so well done and such a such a great resource. So, uh, Tracy, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's incredible what you have pulled together. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about was your your show. Why don't you oh. get why don't you put a plug in for that too? Okay. So the Dementia Home Care Show airs on the third Tuesday of every month on USA Global TV and Radio. It is available via YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, YouTube's probably the easiest place to find the show. And if you just type in either my name, which is Tracy Cram Perkins, it'll be easier to find the dementia home care show um, or if you go to usa global tv's uh, youtube page and look at playlists you'll be able to scroll down and find the the past episodes yeah we talk about all sorts of different things uh, I talk, we've talked to Loretta Vaney, who's the Lego lady. Uh, we've talked to, as you mentioned, uh, Suzanne Newman is, uh, and her answers for elders. I've talked to Kitty Isley about her 24 seven podcast and caregiving. And we also talked to a, a woman that has done the virtual dementia tour and how it changed the way she cared for her mother. So, I mean, there's just so many impactful things that go on that, that, can really help. And if you are interested in tuning in, I please invite you to join us. Wonderful. And, you know, to our listeners, I hope you like, click and share this episode. I think we covered just so much ground um, to really be able to help you live better at home and, and just get your mind thinking in a little different direction of why things are happening. Um, to me, that was one of the biggest hurdles I had to get over was I think initially I thought, and I think a lot of families think, oh, they're just acting this way. They're just pushing my buttons. They know how to push my buttons. And it's not about pushing our buttons at all. It's about them feeling comfortable and safe. And the simple things that we can do to really make that better for them is, is massively huge. So, you know, if you share this with your sphere of influence, if it's on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn, there are so many people out there dealing with dementia who still haven't kind of come clean and, and out of the closet because they're stigmatized as family members. It's not just the person with dementia that's struggling with this. There's there, and there could be a lot of denial. And so the more information that we can get out there, the more support, the easier we're going to be able to make their lives. And, and so, you know, as you learn these things, you know, be a giver of hope, spread the word, because again, we don't know any of us could be next. You know, dementia has 
no boundaries. They don't really care who we are, where we live, how much money we have. Uh, that None of that stuff matters when it comes to this disease. So we all just have to do a better job living in community and sharing resources. So again, you can go to tracycramperkins.com for her website. You'll be able to get lots of different information there, but again, access her book. Uh, you can email her at Tracy at tracycramperkins.com. She is on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and Twitter, which is now called X, which I still can't get used to. So, you know, follow her on all of those things and, you know, spread the word. And uh, thank you all for being part of our community. And again, Tracy, thank you so much for taking time and sharing all you've learned um, with the world and uh, sharing that with us here on Alzheimer's Speaks. Greatly appreciate it. Lori, thank you so much for giving the opportunity to share this with your audience. You have a wonderful week. Bye now, everyone.